but it doesn't really matter. And in fact, in general, on school days, schools might need more power. On non-school days, they might need less. And so we should have ways of easily sharing power uh, within and between buildings um, in a very simple manner uh, that we don't have today. And so that's, that got me going on this topic area, which I've been obsessed with for the last five and a half years. The second thing is July 14th is the Independence Day for uh, France when they had the revolution, you know, 200 and some years ago. And so I want to sort of have a revolutionary um, sense towards some ideas that people have about how electricity works. So that's the other reason why July 14th would have been a good day. So anyways, so this got me started on this topic area. Uh, and I suppose a key way of summarizing it is I want things to be organized from the bottom up and not from the top down. I think that's how technology is usually developed. It's developed at small scale and then scaled up. Um, and what I'm concerned about electricity is people are trying to take our electricity systems as a whole and then scale down how they operate to smaller and smaller units. And I just don't think that's an effective way uh, to do things. So uh, this is not the actual phone that was in my house when I was growing up, but it looks just like the one that was there. Uh, actually, I think ours, might, I don't remember if it was black or if it was beige, but it was something you know, otherwise was just like that. Um, it was part of the, the single phone system. Uh, it, it couldn't do anything independently. It did, was very good at making phone calls, but it couldn't do anything else. So that's the way uh, communications used to be. Um, one way we could have moved in the future was taken that and essentially digitized the, the 1960s or the 1970s uh, technology. Um, and actually, we did we we did get ISDN lines out of this, which which do which which are really good phone lines, but they're only phone lines, so that's why people aren't that interested in them. Um, but ultimately, if if all you do is if you digitize old technology, then you can't give new functionality to people, and people want new functionality. So in 1964 in New York, uh, the phone companies in the U.S. promised that we would have video phones, and as far as I know, they never sold video phones. It's been 51 years since then. Of course, now you can do a video conference on Skype for free, but the point is, is that the, the old way of doing things couldn't deliver advanced functionality in the way that the internet could, uh, a new way of doing things. So instead, instead of digitizing our old phones, we went to a completely different paradigm for how we do communications. Um, and the most important things that these devices do were fundamentally impossible with the old way of doing things. And so if you're trying to approach it from improving the old uh, technology, you, you have to get uh, to break free of, of the old way of thinking about things. And also, an important point is that actually this digital technology is in, in a lot of ways more expensive than the old technology, but it's so valuable that we're um, willing to pay for it. So in terms of what I want to cover in this talk, um, I want to talk about this comparison between you know, electricity systems and communication systems, uh, the need for what I call a network model of power, which is where power exists in a network of domains instead of a single domain. Um, a, a layered model, which I call network power integration for how to organize a, a network model of power. And then local power distribution is the name I give for my specific proposal on how to do it. Now, other people may come up with other proposals for how to move electricity into a, a network age. Uh, I haven't actually seen them, um, but, the, but I, I certainly believe that my model may not be the best one, but it's the best one I've seen. Um, and then talk some about power quality and reliability, and then uh, wrap up. So LPD, which is this uh, local power distribution, that's one of the two key words I want you to remember after this. The other is uh, a nanogrid, which I'll explain later what that is. So when I say local, um, it's within a building or campus. My, my work only extends uh, does not extend past the utility meter into the utility grid. That's outside my uh, area of domain. But power distribution is whatever technology we have that moves electrons from where they are to where they're wanted. So it's how we move elect electricity around. And again, it's a, it's a network model of power. So it's just in terms of terminology, um, there's these three terms, microgrid, nanogrid, and picogrid. I'm actually not gonna cover picogrids today. But a microgrid, by the most common definitions, is essentially an electricity system that can operate independently of a utility grid. Um, so it's defined by its capability. It's not defined by its size in terms of electricity. Um, a lot of people will talk about sort of large microgrids or small microgrids, but a microgrid, it is my, my computer, um, or this computer, in fact, is a microgrid by, 
by this definition. So electricity system that has local storage and it can be operated unplugged from um, an electricity system. I define a nanogrid as the most simple possible electricity system uh, in the same way that if you get down to an individual atom, you can't cut an atom in half and have the same material. You, you fundamentally don't have it anymore. So a nanogrid is the, the smallest possible unit of um, power distribution. This computer is also a nanogrid because it distributes power to attached USB ports and you, you can't cut, cut this in, uh, in, in half and have it still function. It's, whereas, but you could put a collection of nanogrids together and form a larger network. And then a grid is an individual device that can operate independently. And in fact, a notebook computer is also a grid, as it turns out. So those are um, terms, and then I want to move on to the, the substance of the talk. So Thomas Edison, uh, he installed the first, um, well, what's recognized as the first sort of significant electricity system in, in New York 133 years ago, and he actually died 84 years uh, ago. So he lived for a long time after that. So if he uh, came back to life today and he looked at our systems of generating electricity, they would look very foreign to him compared to what was um, around in the 1880s. If he looked at how our end use devices that we have, they would also look very foreign. But if he looked at how electricity is moved around within buildings, it would be completely familiar. Uh, very little has advanced in this area in the last hundred and something years. And so that's another reason why I think it's uh, high time for us to, to do something. So our electricity system today is generally a, what I call a unitary grid. It's a single pool of power that we, we dump power into and take care of it out. And in the way that utility people think about this, buildings and every device in buildings are simply part of the utility grid uh, as a whole. And particularly for alternating current systems, they, they fundamentally are. So that's, and this is very much the way the phone system used to be organized as a single unitary system. Um, so that's how we do things traditionally. And uh, so I sort of think of the grid as a bathtub where you dump power in and you take power out, except that it's a very shallow bathtub. It has no capacity because there's no storage in the grid. And we're dumping in from lots of sources and taking out from lots of sources. And so as we get more uh, renewables in the grid and such, then the people who manage utility grids naturally want to go out and uh, and mess with individual devices and buildings to get them to help uh, balance the grid. And I understand that's what they want to do, but I think that's a terrible idea. They, they shouldn't do that. Um, so what I want to move to, and I'll, I'll bring this back later in the, uh, in the talk, is a, is a network model where power exists in, in multiple domains that are interconnected with each other. So the, the, the phone system and the utility grid were actually invented at about the same time. They're both highly coupled synchronous systems. They're both central. Uh, they're operated by very conservative organizations that uh, are, are generally regulated because they're monopolies. Uh, technology was advanced slowly, in part because they want to make it uh, reliable. Um, there's always local variations in how technology works. And they really only do one thing. The electricity system gives you electrons, uh, and the phone system gave you phone calls and nothing else. So. Um, we have the sort of the old paradigms, and the, the, the internet uh, disrupted that in a lot of ways. It was a, a product of a different century. It's inherently distributed instead of being centralized, and the internet, there, there's storage everywhere. You know, end use devices have storage. Um, and when I'm talking about storage in this case, uh, memory storage. Uh, and then you know, switches and routers have storage to buffer it. And of course, it was only through digital technology and memory that we could actually have packet switching and network communications. Um, and so the, these systems are very tightly coupled, whereas um, because of the presence of storage, you can have things much more loosely coupled, and that has a lot of advantages. Um, in the internet, it's, it's very critical to try to isolate complexity and technologies, and that's what the OSI model does, is isolate things to layers. Uh, in the utility systems, technologies tend to be very entangled with each other, uh, which when the utility grid was really only a, a product of uh, one company organizing, that's one thing. But as people want to get lots of companies sort of selling power into the grid, and they want to have complicated financial arrangements with individual devices and buildings, they're trying to entangle technology from lots of different organizations, and that gets to be a real mess. Um, these systems are generally custom, and so therefore very expensive, whereas internet technologies um, can be uh, quite inexpensive because they're produced at mass scale. 
but every other year I go to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, uh, which is the largest trade show on the planet, and it's uh, it's mind-boggling just how much uh, <laughs> technology is out there. So, anyways, so um, while there are a lot of sort of surface similarities between communications networks and power networks, uh, there's one fundamental difference: is that Bits and data packets are all different, so we have to route them over long distances, but electrons, luckily, are all the same, so it's really only their location, timing, and uh, quantity that matters, not their identity. So um, to move data around a communications network, we have to route the data to know where they, uh, where they want to end up. But with electricity systems, the question is, how do we know where power should flow if we have a network of power systems? And so my proposal and the basis of local power distribution is that local prices should determine where electricity goes. So if you have uh, one power domain where it's 10 cents per kilowatt hour and another one where it's 15 cents, then naturally you would expect power to flow uphill towards higher prices, towards higher value. And so that's how you can move power around. Um, routing electricity through a, a network has been proposed by many people. It makes no sense whatsoever, but people will continue to propose it, I'm sure, um, because they think of routing data packets, and so they naturally want to, to try to put electricity. It's, it's, um, it is kind of amusing. So any, any quick clarification questions so far? Just uh, take a check here. OK. So um, of course, the internet only was possible once technology advanced to create some of the fundamental ingredients towards it. And my belief is we now have a, a lot of the fundamental ingredients towards moving electricity to a different model. Um, let's see. So one important thing is that with internet communication, we, we could adopt new models of operation which were unfamiliar to the phone system. And really, uh, internet types of communications initially were quite expensive. And so nobody was adopting them as a less expensive or more efficient way of doing things. They were, uh, they were adopting it for their, for their new futures. Now, ultimately, uh, because technologies have come down so fast, we do route things like phone calls over um, internet protocol packets. It ultimately is more efficient and less expensive. But that wasn't clear at the beginning, and so that wasn't why people um, did it. Um, and there's, there's a book that I read years ago called The, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, where you have uh, it's very similar to evolutionary systems, where long periods where you get small incremental advances in, uh, in science, um, in this case, and then s some sudden shift to a different way of thinking, uh, as opposed to uh, scientific advances sort of following on more of a linear path. And so it, it's an interesting, uh, it's very applicable to this um, subject area here. So of course, it, for many uh, you know, thousands or hundreds of years, uh, people thought the Earth was the center of the universe, and then eventually we realized, well, no, it's, it's more useful to think of the sun being at the center, uh, or people thinking the Earth was flat, and then you know, understanding it's round. Uh, people can live with sort of a quote unquote wrong way of thinking for a long period of time, and then when a different approach comes along, they can be very resistant to it. And I, I, I think that we're at that sort of a point wherein we have the old utility grid model, and we need to a new we need to move to a new way of thinking about electricity. So, I've been following the the smart grid in the U.S. for you know since the term first sort of being used over ten years ago, um, and I was sort of immediately suspicious of it, in part because they said that the grid didn't stop at the meter; it went out to everything in the building, and I thought that the building and the grid should be really much more separate. Um, and again, what it's trying to do is to digitize our 19th century models. Um, and it's amazing how, in the smart grid way of looking at things, the purpose of everything else is to serve the needs of the grid. Devices and buildings are to serve the needs of the grid. People are supposed to serve the needs of the grid. Business models are all about serving the needs of the grid. It's a very sort of grid-centric way of thinking about things. And fundamentally, the grid should be there to serve us. So they've got the, the relationship um, backwards. And so that's why I think of it sort of as these, what's at the center of it? If you get that wrong, everything else is going to be wrong. Um, it's, it takes our problems of unitary grid and just, I think it's going to make them worse. And I think eventually um, it's all going to fall apart uh, as, a, as an idea. Um, it tries to innovate by scaling down technology. People take utility grid systems and say, let's have microgrids be miniature utility grids, uh, which guarantees they'll be really expensive so that people won't buy them. Uh, 
And essentially, the smart grid is, is a series of band-aid after band-aid after band-aid you know, to try to um, fix what's problem, apparent problems in the system without being willing to cons uh, consider the fundamental problems. Um, and another thing they do is they, they figure out a business model and then design technologies around that business model. Now, the internet protocol was not designed around a business model. It was designed to do information distribution. People have then layered business models on top of the technology, and I believe that's the appropriate way to do this. If you have a good technology, it'll be applicable to any business model, and the reverse is not true. So uh, this is a, you, you find all kinds of diagrams like this in the smart grid world, this incredibly complicated systems, and you have to think that, you know, the likelihood that this is gonna work and be secure uh, and be cost effective are probably um, quite low, but people keep proposing very highly complex uh, technologies. And, and in the internet world, we don't have such systems where systems are uh, so, so convoluted internally. We, we isolate technologies um, and, and make things interoperable. So it's, it's the people who are trying to re-engineer um, our electricity system seem to be unfamiliar with the past history of the past 50 years of how technologies have advanced um, in the electronics domain. So, again, I want to organize things from the bottom up. Um, my belief is that in the long run, every link that transmits power will be digitally, um, d digitally managed. And this comes from a day when, you know, traditionally no links of power were traditionally man digitally managed. But in fact, with communications, there was a time when all communications were analog, and we've now moved to a world where essentially all communications are digital. So I think the same sort of thing will happen with, uh, with power. Um, storage is really a critical thing to this. Storage can enable you to decouple electricity systems so everything doesn't have to be completely synchronous uh, in the way that it is with our AC systems. Um, another important point is that we want to diverse the technology that's in buildings from the technologies um, in the grid. And if you look at how uh, the internet works, within buildings we use things like um, Ethernet and Wi-Fi that are technologies not used in the internet backbone and vice versa. Um, now, IP packets can flow between them, but we're not trying to force the systems to use the, the same technology. Um, technology within buildings can be universal. You know, use Wi-Fi here, just like in my house or my office, uh, you know, it can be used anywhere. Whereas the um, utility backbone technologies tend to be regionally specific. There's lots of different versions of DSL, cable technologies uh, vary from place to place. And that's okay because that's within the domain of the service provider. Um, but it's, it's critically important that within, inside the buildings, the things be universal technologies. Um, we need to experiment with both shared media and point-to-point -point links. Ethernet started out as a shared medium where you'd have one wire with lots of devices on it, and eventually people realized that Ethernet worked better if you had uh, only point-to-point -point links for data transmission. But then we've, with Wi-Fi, of course, we have a shared medium again. So in communications, people, things have moved back and forth uh, between those. In power, traditionally, you have a pool of power within the grid or a pool of power within the building. In my model, I'm actually proposing that all power links be only peer-to-peer. -peer. So that's a, a big departure from how things are usually done. Um, but I think that's an open research question as to uh, whether um, shared medium where you have lots of devices on a single pool of power uh, are valuable. Um, I think we need to build end-use devices with multiple physical layers. I mean, this computer has Ethernet, Wi-Fi, probably Bluetooth. It has a variety of different ways of communicating. Uh, I, I believe in the future we'll want device, many devices to have several different ways that could be uh, powered, maybe some of them AC and some of them DC, uh, to give us more flexibility as opposed to today when we assume that everything only has one way of being powered. But finally, that it's essential for things to be, to be simple in order to be interoperable and flexible and inexpensive. And while there is real complexity in our technologies, we contain them, we contain them with the individual devices, or we contain them into to layers um, in communications so that the complexity is not a burden, uh, so that it could be uh, managed. So in electricity systems, there's a myth that power is equally available everywhere. And so therefore, you have a constant um, price. And um, most people in the world pay a, a constant price of electricity you know, across the day and, and week and such. Now, people say that a stopped clock is, is uh, correct twice a day, which is true, but what that means is most of the time, the stopped clock is wrong. So if you have a fixed price of electricity, 
the price is tr trying to get you to understand how available something is, then most of the time it's gonna be wrong because sometimes power should be really less expensive than it is and sometimes it should be more. Um, so we absolutely need to move to a uh, position where the price that's given to buildings uh, varies over the course of the day and week and month to accurately reflect the true supply demand balance on the grid. Um, what a lot of people are doing is trying to take the fact that uh, we charge constant prices of electricity and then make agreements around that uh, with people to actually then get them to change their load. But, but they're, again, they're putting a band-aid on it. They're, they're not fixing the fundamental problem of charging the wrong price. Um, within utility grids, in fact, there is something called locational marginal price where utility engineers understand that the value of electricity is different within the grid uh, depending on when it is and where you are. So they recognize that, in fact, electricity is not equally available, but we just don't really bill for electricity that day. Now, within a so a, a critical point of what I'm arguing for is what I call local prices, where prices of electricity within buildings or within parts of buildings, as the supply demand condition in, uh, within, inside the buildings um, changes. So as you get more local storage generation, the ability to island from the utility grid, or capacity constraints and, and other things, um, there's lots of reasons why the price within a building might differ from the price uh, on the utility grid. So. Um, yeah, so these are some, so let's say there's a, a price, whether it's fixed or variable for, from the utility rate at the meter, there's all kinds of reasons why uh, you might have a different um, price within the building. For, for example, I believe the utilities will need to go a model where they sell electricity at one price and buy back electricity from the customer at a lower price in order to cover the cost of their fixed infrastructure. And so for your building, it depends on whether you're in buy mode or sell mode as to what the marginal value of power would be uh, within your building. You may, look, you may value carbon. So even if you're buying electricity at 20 cents a kilowatt hour, if you think there's a carbon burden to that power of 5 cents, then you should really be telling your devices that, hey, power is 25 cents a kilowatt hour. Anytime you go through some processing or conversion of power, the, that should be accounted for uh, in the price. So for example, if you go through a battery, uh, and you lose 10% in the round trip. And if it was 22, 20 cents going in, it should be uh, 22 cents coming out to reflect uh, that battery loss. So the devices would see the differential prices depending on, on the system. And there's other reasons why you might want to then change your local price to better match supply and demand within your local grid inside of your building. Um, so a critical thing here then is uh, we're, is to have communications about power be pervasive. So in these are two terms that I've introduced uh, over the last year uh, to try to capture them. One is uh, we have standard DC power, uh, which is things that are defined by a technology standard so that you can plug, for example, uh, USB into some device and for managing power it will just work. Um, well, standard DC is when, uh, well, Non-standard DC is something like if you have an external power supply with some random co connector that goes into something, but it's not a standard barrel size or voltage so that th the things are not interoperable. Then when you go to manage DC, then you have communications that manage the, the distribution of pow power over that link. And USB and Ethan are the, um, the primary examples of that. And what they have is they have generalized data communication, but there's a separate channel of communications um, to talk about the power. So when you plug something into a computer that wants power, it has to ask the computer for power, and there's a negotiation process. It's a very simple negotiation, but it's a negotiation um, nonetheless. So over this cable you have power, general communications, and communication about the power, and that's the critical element which enables this uh, network model of power. So um, it actually, in USB, that communications, the communications of power are over different wires, with Ethernet and other over the same wires, it doesn't really matter. The point is that it's over the same, the same cable. So when you get managed DC, you can have plug and play operation not only for end use devices, we certainly expect that of plugging something in the wall, but you could then have that for generation storage where you could just go to a store, buy a solar panel, and have anybody just literally plug it into a box in their house, which might look like an Ethernet switch, in fact, might even be an Ethernet switch. And so this can drive down the costs of um, deploying local renewables and local storage, which today, at least in the US, it's very expensive because you have to 
expensive designs, uh, permitting, uh, custom installations, and such. Um, and you get some other uh, benefits in terms of how you can manage the distribution of power. Um, this technology naturally starts with direct current power because um, you, you inherently get that decoupling that you don't have with AC systems. Um, you can also get greater efficiency. If you have local DC generation and local DC storage, um, if you can go straight to DC end use devices, which I think you know everything in this room is operating DC internally, uh, then you can save energy by not having the AC DC conversions and losing power there, but you also actually reduce the hardware needed because um, you have to spend money to buy those AC DC conversions uh, and they can be unreliable. So the other thing this does is this offers these new powering models of networks of power and having the, the direction of power um, switch. In fact, with the USB now, uh, you can send 100 watts over a USB cable and the direction of power flow can uh, switch depending on that negotiation. And there are variants of Ethernet that also have that capability. So we're starting to actually have a produce a mass scale some of the technological features that we need for this network model of power. So um, this probably repeats some of the things I already said. Is the Qualcomm quick charge to standard based on the same price? Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Is that a. Well, the, to, see, there's a power bank and a mobile phone, they will negotiate with each other what is the current requirement uh -huh. to get to that level of voltage and power within specified period. So that's managing the, the yeah, charging they current and all this and such? Before the actual charging process. It's yeah. the latest standard, Qualcomm Smart Charge. Okay, yeah, well that's another example of digitally managed power distribution, you know, for a fairly specific purpose, but, but yeah, that would be another example of that. Any other comments or questions so far? Um, okay, so my network model, this is the OSI model for data communications. Um, so what I'm proposing is that we have technologies for managing power distribution, which uh, occupy the equivalents to the uh, lower layers. Um, and, and that's what I'm trying to do. Any device separately that needs to know um, how it uh, it's, it's functional goals. So, for example, this projector might, or the, this lights might know that it's 20 cents a kilowatt hour, and they might want to know sort of at what dimming level. If the if the price of electricity went up a lot, they might begin to dim, or if it went up a whole lot more, it might um, turn off entirely. But the point being that any individual device would participate in protocols for power distribution, per, participate in separate protocols for functionality, and then integrate those two internally. And so that's how you can uh, separate these things into um, coherent layers. What people typically try to do is they try to merge power distribution with functional control, and, and, and that makes things more complicated and less interoperable. And as an example, in my office, my computer is 115 volts AC, the lights are 277 volts AC, and my phone is 48 volts DC. So all three devices are sort of powered differently even though they should be functionally coordinating. Um, they're also powered on circuits with devices that they have no functional control. So separating the power distribution from the functional control uh, has a whole lot of advantages. And what that means is that each of these can then evolve separately in the same way that our physical layers of uh, communicating data evolve separately from our application layers of doing things with that data. So that's this is a foundational element of the model I'm proposing. Does this make sense so far? Okay. Um, then if we look at how things are organized, in, in IT networks we have local area networks, building campus networks, and then the wider internet. And so what I'm proposing is a similar model where we would have nanogrids, building scale uh, microgrids, and then of course um, the utility grids. Nanogrids fully functioning the way I described them with a the local price don't yet exist. That's the technology we need. Microgrid to exist, but they uh, tend to be sort of more custom designed, and so we don't really have truly interoperable microgrids. So we're, we're missing good microgrid technology um, as well. And with data connections, you, you, you don't have sort of horizontal connections between networks. So for example, I don't have a data connection between my house and my next door neighbor's house because I almost never exchange data with, with them. In fact, even 
when I, if I send an email to my neighbor, it's gonna go out to a, some service provider and then come back to them, it's not gonna go across the fence. With electricity though, since electrons are all the same, it can make sense to have connections from one building to the next building for sharing power and exchanging it, and that could be useful for a whole lot of purposes. So we really should be able to just throw a, a Cat5 cable or some other cable over a fence, plug two houses together or you know, within a building, uh, and have things um, just work. Um, so a nanogrid, uh, it, it has um, communications, uh, you would almost all, probably always have, have almost always have some storage within it, and you have end-use devices that are consuming power. So again, this very, looks very much like a USB hub or, or an Ethernet switch. And then you have gateways to uh, other nanogrid controllers or to local generation, which operates as a special form of nanogrid controller. And, and power over these links can be bidirectional. Power over these links only ever flows in one direction towards end-use devices. So with this as a basic building block, you could then create networks of arbitrary topologies um, based on nanogrids. And there's a single price within each nanogrid, so each device gets the same price. And then you, when you, uh, if you want to exchange power of one of these links, then you compare the local price of one to the local price of the other, and, just, and then they can decide if they want to exchange power. So it's again, it's the smallest uh, unit of power distribution. Um, it's really a single, uh, single domain. And so what this means is that in this uh, model, there's only two types of devices. There's end-use devices and nanogrid controllers, very much the same as we have in internet networks where we have uh, hosts you know, at the edge of the network and we have network equipment. There's only two types of entities uh, in IP networks. And so it's a nice, simple model, uh, but yet it can, again, create arbitrary, um, uh, arbitrary sizes of networks. And again, we need to have a wide range in the um, in the capacity of these, of these links, just like we have wide ranges in our capacities of our communications links. So that's what uh, a nanogrid is. So then you can imagine this might be uh, somebody's house where you have a network of nanogrids. Some of them might be, might be at different voltages. Some might be AC, some might be DC, some might be isolated. And you could make or break these connections at will, and then the power would automatically be uh, flowing around uh, depending on where, where it's available from your local generation or via electric vehicles um, and as your end-use devices want. So again, this is all operating inside of a building. Now, a microcontroller might actually be just any other uh, nanogram controller. It's not clear to me that there's actually any function different you need at the building level than you need at one of these other levels. But I think until we really create this technology, uh, we just have to um, have to see. Now, an important point about this is that for purposes of managing power, only devices at either end of a cable talk to each other. There's no multi-hop communications. So this grid controller here not only never talks to this one down here because this is in between, it doesn't even know it's there. And so because for purposes of power, you don't need um, to know that. So this makes this much more secure uh, and private than systems which require sort of uh, visibility uh, beyond them. So this is simple, contained, um, and yet and yet effective. Now, some people have said we should have sort of more network models inside of utility grids. I'm not actually sure that there's sufficient advantage within a utility grid to, to do that, but that's outside of my domain, so I don't make any claims about that. But I think it's be highly valuable within buildings. So again, only two types of devices and only two types of interfaces. And in fact, electrically, these types of interfaces, um, you could use the same ones over the controller to end-use device links and as well as between controllers, it's just that the negotiation, the communications across that link um, might be different. So this is a, just so you know that I'm not totally up to lunch, this is an IEEE standard that was developed over like the last four or five years um, and it's actually ratified recently. It was initially developed for charging, um, uh, essentially a universal standard for power adapters for uh, computers and other such devices. I think it, it actually it won't take off because USB will now take over that market since USB now goes up to 100 watts, but that wasn't true at the time this project was started. But they have bi-directional power exchange, um, the ability to have local but storage locally within devices, 
you know, the plug and play um, local generation. So a lot of the same types of ideas. The one thing they don't have in this is a local price to know where the power should go. And that's a critical thing, because if you don't have that, how do you know which direction power should flow across a cable? Um, I think I've, this sort of summarizes things I've already said, so I'll skip this slide. So um, a, bunch, a bunch of these things that we need for this model, um, USB and Ethernet already have. Well, Ethernet doesn't quite have it, but there are variants of Ethernet uh, that, that do have things like um, 100 watts per cable and bidirectional power. And Ethernet, the Ethernet Standards Organization is, is increasing the amount of power you can send over an Ethernet cable, um, principally by sending power over all four pairs of wires instead of just two as they say, as they do t um, today. Um, but they need this local price and we need to have the communications for these controller to controller links. Um, actually, I was looking at the, the symbol for DC power, which this is, uh, you know, the symbol for AC power is a sine wave. And it occurred to me that this sort of looks very digital. And so it's sort of the sense that DC is naturally uh, the starting point for digitally mediated power. Finally, there's a question about whether you have, um, whether you have more than one uh, device across the cable, this is the shared medium question. Um, and that's, anyways, that's, that's a research question. So what I would anticipate a typical house might look like in, in 20 years is a, collection of DC nanogrids that are connected to each other that integrate your local generation and your local storage and all the devices where you really care about reliability. And then you'd have some amount of AC infrastructure that you would have be reliable for when the grid goes out. And then um, a bunch of other devices that would not be powered when the grid goes out. So like, for example, I have an electric clothes dryer and uh, that doesn't need to be, I don't need to spend the money to have, um, to have that be reliable. So this, an advantage of this is you can introduce the technology slowly and organically. You don't have to change everything in the building at, at once, which is uh, typically gonna be very expensive. So this um, is sort of the deployment path and shows you know, the relationship between the AC parts of systems and the DC parts. Um, if you consume most of your local generation um, locally, then actually the, the physical size of this uh, inverter and rectifier uh, could be a lot smaller than it might be otherwise, and then therefore um, saving money. Um, okay. So there's an emerging standard for 380 volts DC power, which is you know, a lot more efficient if you have higher uh, capacity needs. This was started with data centers um, where there's a lot of advantages to supplying uh, servers and network equipment data centers with DC power. And you simply, it's hard to get enough over 48 volts to devices. So <clears throat> 380 volts, they have a standard connector, but they don't have any standard communications. So I'm proposing that Ethernet be the medium to manage power across these 380 volt links, again, to scale up how much power we can send over one of these digitally managed links in the same way that um, Ethernet is scaled up by a factor of 10,000 from its initial speed to the maximum speed you can get with Ethernet today. And USB also scaled up by almost a factor of 10,000 in terms of the original speed of USB versus what you can get with the highest speed. So once you have the technology, market demand can cause it to, to scale up. Um, the last topic area here is uh, power quality and reliability. In in traditionally, grids provide one, one sense of, of um, reliability, but some devices really want more reliable power, certainly uh, medical, medical equipment and uh, a lot of IT equipment. And a lot of other devices can use less reliable and less low, lower quality power. Um, sort of similar to uh, you know, drinking water standards, where uh, if you only have one quality of your drinking water, then it's it's the same water for, for drinking as in you know, wa uh, watering your plants with, and that doesn't really make sense. So we really need to have technologies which can enable differential quality and reliability within the building so you can get the right quality and reliability to devices that they need. Uh, and this can save money in terms of equipment and can also um, 
save energy. And so local power distribution helps get uh, the right balance of power and quality and reliability. Um, yeah, I think I already said these things. So, uh, oh, I'm not sure what happened there. Oh, because there's a figure that disappears. So, okay, we'll just, uh -huh, okay. Um, well, what this is showing is that the as you increase the amount of reliability you have in a utility grid, you, you increase the cost you have in hardware and operations of having your system be more reliable. As you do that, though, the burden you have of the system being unreliable drops, and so you then have some optimum point of where your the, the marginal increases or decreases in reliability, um, you get the lowest overall societal cost. If you can have you know, microgrids and nanogrids, and if you could be more um, nuanced about how much quality and reliability each device gets, you can shift this point over, have a lower, low, less reliable grid, and, and save money, and put that money into a local reliability where it's more useful uh, and, and cheaper to provide. So, um, and actually, the, the internet is, is a good example of this. You know, our, our mobile phones are a lower quality voice than the, the phone I grew up with. Um, and they're less reliable because they drop out sometimes, but they're so much more useful that, that we accept that. And if you really want high quality communication over the internet, you can get it. Um, but we can be much more uh, nuanced in providing the right amount of quality and reliability at any particular time. So there are some open questions in this whole area. Uh, I mentioned shared media, um, what, how to create higher capacity links so they can create uh, larger networks of power. Uh, and we will initially develop this for uh, DC power systems, then how do we adapt that to AAC systems, uh, particularly since they tend to, they're, they're synchronous with their um, the AC frequency. It's, but, I, but I believe that some aspects like the local price can be applied to AC systems. Um, in, in the US at least, as buildings get more efficient and as you get more local generation, the, the amount of power going across the utility grid is just gonna drop. And so I think that we're gonna actually have a probably a crisis of finances for utilities because they'll have the same infrastructure that they are trying to amortize over 40 year periods, but less and less power sales to, of which to cover that. So the last thing we wanna do is to saddle up the utilities with a lot more capital that they have to pay off. So in fact, putting the money into local power distribution can help save the utilities by um, putting those features within the buildings instead of the, within the grid. And again, so that I believe the US should work towards making its electricity grid less reliable over time because we simply won't need it to be as reliable. Um, actually, I'll, I'll skip this just because I'm, I'm not an expert in, in, in Indian power system, so I'll, I'll let you all figure out how this applies to, uh, um, to India. But I, again, this should be useful in all, in all contexts in the same way that the internet protocol is useful in all contexts. Um, so I, I started with this point about how this might apply to a, a village which is off-grid. And, and that's where this, this sort of plug-and-play architecture can be really useful, where as people's needs change and equipment breaks or gets added and such, or as seasons change, you can sort of rearrange your power systems um, much more dynamically or organically uh, than in the past. And as I've observed this, the space, uh, this energy access space, where we have this sort of hierarchy of different types of technologies, what you find is that the hardware used in one, you can't use in the other one. I mean, we really need to have a continuum so that electrical hardware can be used in any context, grid or off-grid, um, but by having these networks, um, networks of power. And as far as security and privacy, to operate a centralized grid, you really then want to have the grid have visibility sort of th throughout systems and visibility through the meter, and that's a real disaster for privacy and also for security. By decoupling systems in this model, you can avoid the need to have um, visibility into what's going on within buildings. Uh, and it's much, it's better for the security of the building, it's better for the security of the grid, and it's better for everyone's privacy if we don't um, require that. 
And, and having much better, much better electrical systems does not require compromising security and privacy, as a lot of people uh, propose. So finally, um, I believe this is the answer for how to create a network model power, but uh, other people may come up with other proposals, and we should look at them. Um, I think the only way that microgrids are going to be successful broadly is if they're commodity products, and the way to do that is to have them based on networks of microgrid of nanogrids. Um, the missing technologies are pricing and gateways uh, between them, and hopefully this will be successful so that you know 30 years from now, most buildings, both in India and the U.S., will have uh, functioning nanogrids within them in the same way that most buildings, at least in the U.S., have uh, Wi-Fi and will have a much better way of distributing power uh, than we do today. So, thank you. Any uh, questions or comments or? So, I think that the architecture that you present is quite uh, different to what the standard architectures are. So, you are, uh, you are propagating for a peer-to-peer -peer or a meshing type of network, power network model, right? Yeah. Uh, which is very different to the current way of centralized uh, generation, storage, distribution, everything. Right? So, I just want to understand, like, what has, what, how has other, how have other people reacted to such a uh, very aggressive model of peer-to-peer -peer power distributions? Like, uh, uh, what comments have come back to you on this? Because uh, the, this, as as of now, doesn't exist. So, how difficult or how easy would it be for people to really? do a paradigm shift to this type of model? Well, it, it doesn't exist in the sense of USB and Ethernet do operate on a, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis for power. So we have some of the basic building blocks, um, but we don't have products available that can really effectively utilize that to a significant degree. So my belief is once there are products available that people can buy, um, then people would start buying them because they would be useful. Uh, a, a lot of people, React is like, well, this seems very promising. We should, you know, try it out. We should do experiments, you know, build systems that operate this way and see how, how they perform. Um, but we haven't sort of been able to ask those questions to really test it. I certainly believe this is a scientific question. We need to try things out and test them uh, and see if they work, you know, as I expect they will or not as well or perhaps even better. So how far have you gone to this idea? Like, have you built uh, anything? Have you shown this concept? Uh, do you have a small test bed where you? People so I, I <laughs> so so the, the sad thing is, I, I have zero research funding for the sub area, so I haven't built anything. Uh, so at this point, it's all it's all hot air. But you know, maybe you, some of you in this room, could uh, start working on this topic because it's not that complicated. Actually, it's not it doesn't require huge facilities. It's something you could do on a, on, a, on a tabletop with. Uh, products that are not that hard to build. The the innovation here is just on the communications protocols aspect, to uh, and then some of the computation to do things like setting the local price. Um, but those are those are not uh, burdensome to do. So if, if anyone here wants to start working on it, it is the kind of thing that really can be very distributed in terms of how this uh, develops. Now, once we know what the communication should be. Then we have to put it into these technologies. So, for example, I'm trying to add uh, local price to Ethernet as we speak because they're changing the Ethernet standards. So, this is an opportunity to add some of these features. Unfortunately, I don't know the whole feature set needed, so I can't propose that. Um, so, the, the only thing that uh, strikes me is like uh, I like the analogy of your network model and your power models, and you're trying to somehow give a one-to-one -one mapping as to how network science evolved and how uh, power science or the network of power science is trying to catch up with that. And now, the peer-to-peer the -peer model, power model that you're, that you're envisioning, uh, so basically when you're trying to do a peer-to-peer -peer network model, there is no uh, life at risk, right? But when you're doing so there's no life at risk, right? When you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer network model, but when uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer power model, there is, there is a uh, percentage of risk involved because I as a person can typically fl flash out power to you and uh, I don't I, I if I'm not engineered the system well I I may end up giving you power that can be detrimental to your equipments yourself your house 
So there has to be some broker or some intermediate point, even in the local system, some so, some management functionality that can really look at these aspects and condition the power in a better better fashion. Yeah. So, so there's two aspects of this that that address the safety issue. One is that. Um, for things like USB and Ethernet today, when you plug something in, there's just a tiny trickle of power that goes across the cable to enable the device that's using the power to communicate. And only after the negotiation has, to, has completed, then you increase the power level to uh, what's actually wanted. So um, for example, for this, for this 380 volt case, you could have the 380 volt line not energized until the communication across the Ethernet cable has finished. And so you, if you communicate before you energize the line, it's much safer than with AC systems where when you plug something in, it's immediately energized at its, at its full rate. So that helps um, safety. The other one is that if it's a peer-to-peer -peer connection, there's only one device on each cable that can mess you up. Whereas in this building, if there's some device in this building which puts you know, way too much current into a um, into, or either puts in or takes out too much current, it'll affect the whole building. Whereas this only affects the device at the other end of the link. So it's much more compartmentalized as far as safety. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Hi. Um, a lot of um, work is going into building some smart city indices to kind of gauge how well a city is being modernized, and most of them focus a lot on the energy. And how do you build up a smart city? And they show they're always showing pictures of the car that's part of the grid and storing energy for the grid. Are you involved in any such standards in the U.S.? Uh, I am not, and I guess um, for me the only the question is when do you get more advantage by looking at an urban scale? as opposed to just an individual building. And since I, my work is with energy efficiency in buildings, then you know, how efficient this device is, looking at the, the next building over doesn't help, or whether it's a window or insulation. or So for, for saving energy in a building, as an example, um, I don't think you get benefits by going from a building scale to an urban scale. Now for some things like transportation, certainly you do. And for things like the, the car connected to the building, having the price be dynamic so that all the buildings in a given area can give visibility not only to the current price but the, the forecast of future prices and then have their car either charging or discharging appropriate to their needs um, I think it best serve the needs of, of managing power in that context. We have a few projects on campus which are looking at having a local grid or some form of local energy source that feeds back into the institute grid. Uh -huh. You told them about the project? Yeah. Well, that'd be an example where then there could be a local price that's broadcast to all the devices in that network. And then if the utility grid goes down and if your local grid can't serve everything, then the device devices could power themselves down so that you can then balance the supply and demand effectively. Is there any way to ensure like pricing transparency with this? Because it seems like if there's people that are not centrally connected, they might so, not be sure they're getting the right price. Or... So there's there's two things. There's um, the price from the utility grid, and that's going to be at the meter. And so you have to make sure that whatever way of communications that 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 price is being broadcast to the building is correct. And then inside of the building. The pricing is going over to these peer-to-peer uh, -peer communications links. So, and also there's one entity which owns all the devices in the building. So, you know, all the devices in this office are owned by the uh, your your institute uh, and, and somebody's apartment. You know, they own all the infrastructure. So you're not at cross. Per, you're, you're not sort of um, no, nobody's going to get advantage by cheating because you'd just be cheating yourself. So I think I don't think there should be a problem in that account. You said the communication is limited to the port to port. So is uh, suppose you take the nano grid controller, is it switching the packets between the ports and the communication packets? So um, almost all devices will have network connections for for purposes other than power distribution. 
but for purposes of power distribution, they only have to talk to the device at the other end of the wire. So if it's a grid controller to an end-use device, um, the, the end-use device has no visibility into the power infrastructure beyond the grid controller is connected to. Um, so it's only, it's, it's a very contained um, communications for purposes of power. Is, is, does that yeah, I got a since you have a network, we can do the dynamic load management using this network. Then um, if you limit the communication to the uh, to the port to port, it's quite limiting. Having a network already laid out and you have a controller for the purpose of power negotiation. Yeah, so if we go... Um, yeah, here. Yeah. So what you would expect in such a system is that there would be a different local price in each of these nanogrids, yeah, yeah, I, but they would affect each other. So if suddenly there was a whole lot more demand over here, yes. this price is gonna go up and then that's probably gonna cause this to go up yes, some, yes. but not as much. And so it'll, you'll get a gradient of prices across the network to then cause sort of power to flow. Yeah, one is uh, the, the local price is not constant as you said, because I thought it's limiting because you are already proposing a business model, uh, not the technology, at the, the nano grid level. Uh, second thing is that, not even, say, suppose you have the time of the day pricing, okay? Then you can schedule loads using the same network, okay? You can switch off loads, you can control the loads using the same same communication network. I well, uh, it's what I would say, uh, I always talk about loads switching themselves off or loads <laughs> changing their own behavior because each load looks at, at the, um, the, the price that it gets. And actually some loads might have multiple power connections and so they could decide, okay, you know, now I'll use power from this source and then later I'll use power from this source and the same with an energy controller. So there's a lot more flexibility. It's not just a single sense of the value of power. And again, as you have local generation, then even if the grid price goes way up, you may have plenty of local power, and so you may not care, and that may not drive your local price up so much. But I... Yeah, no, no, this was, I, I thought it was, maybe you should look at uh, more scenarios other than this. To me, the, the, the scope look a uh, little limited uh, in terms of uh, the communication. That's what I thought. Yeah, so what needs to happen, and what I have not yet done, is to create a simulation model of such systems and also some working hardware to show that this actually can work in real life. And then try the simplest possible system and see does it do everything we need or is there any additional complexity that needs to be introduced. My instinct is that we don't need more, but we maybe we do and we'll only find that out through experimentation. So other considered the nanogrid or a microgrid controller? What will form, I mean, the controller part? What, what, what will it? What physical devices you expect it? Well, as I say, I expect them to look like USB hubs or ethernet switches because initially, that's exactly what they would be. Um, but as today, USB hubs and ethernet switches tend to have an AC power as they only have one power input and it's always AC. Um, we might have ones with multiple different power inputs of different physical layers. Um, and so you would have these end-use devices would be USB or Ethernet, but again, you'd have more options for um, how the power comes in and also that the power could also go out because you could have storage inside of the nanogrid controller. But they would look, look like Ethernet switches and USB hubs, just something like that. And, and just like we have, you can buy a four port Ethernet switch or you can buy a 200 port Ethernet switch and you have you know, low, you know, 10 megabits per second and 100 gigabits per second. We'll have lots of different scales for different for different needs. So, do we have any more questions? Okay. So let's thank the speaker. Okay. So there is light snacks that is a that has been arranged for you upstairs. So uh, you are all welcome to go upstairs and uh, take some refreshments. Thank you. Thank you.